haven't been able to keep anyone in that house. Okay. So while you're waiting for the movers, can you just check it out and see okay. if you can figure out why everyone breaks their lease and leaves it? Sure. So I have taken everything It is my purpose. It is a gift to feel so lucky to have something and to know that it is lucky to have you. Recognize that background? I know. I was like, you got her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some reason there's some sort of spectral agent in my house for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> i love been that there, been there buddy i don't know what yeah, to vegas guys how are you guys doing doing good how are you i'm doing good thanks for joining me today to talk about a ghost weight our pleasure yeah uh well you know i first of all uh i love the humor in this yeah uh, especially with the feature presentation at the very beginning you know because i was one of those matinee kids and you know in the 70s gen x so <laughs> that was hysterical that was really funny that is uh I, I had I had put that there to kind of as like a placeholder, like, oh, you know, maybe we'll get acquired. And then that's where the card will go for the company. And then McLeod had the idea to uh, play with the play with it a little bit and have it uh, shatter when the girl screams. And she's like, well, that's just that stays. Okay. Yeah, well, because it's, it's my, 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 my philosophy is like is is no one's going to know why you put anything there. So anything you put there, you have to make it count and yep. and and own so i was like all right so let's own it and so i made it dance to the music and then well i always think of uh, joel hodgson you know from mystery science theater 3000 he goes not everyone will get it but the right people will get it you know so when that came up i was like you know it was it was, it was classic uh well mccloud you know you're a handyman you need a place to crash all of a sudden your pizza's missing you know your tape is missing your doors yeah. are slamming what's going on i mean i can't, it, I can't catch a break can't catch a break i mean well, i'll tell you what it's not it's not a ghost because ghosts aren't real that's true don't tell johnny cash though <laughs> very sure <laughs> if only uh, if only uh, the bartender scene too when you're you're playing yourself has to be a shining nod right it actually was not oh um, my gosh well first thing i thought of you know it's like you're doing shining ghost you know i mean it it, it trickled its way in just because of you know um the, the, the subconscious awareness of it. I mean, it looms so large. It's it, it's it's hard not to like <laughs> like when we we put in the line about a clown and a large spider. It was like as soon as we had it in there, the the intent was these are things that these are typical phobias. These are things people are afraid of. But but as soon as we wrote it down, we were like, oh yeah, it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's well, only. Like we, I, I have this like general rule that you should never remind the audience they could be watching a better movie. So, <laughs> you know, like it's not like there's only one there's only one scene in this movie that's like a direct like I just we just stole from another film. But we're, we're both lo film lovers. So, you know, like Beetlejuice wasn't really a thing in my I wasn't thinking about Beetlejuice when I wrote it, but Beetlejuice is one of my favorite movies. Um, and I'm, I always say like my, my brain is basically a hard drive of every movie I've ever seen and song I've ever heard on, on shuffle. So, you know, yeah, stuff like The Shining and Beetlejuice and, and all this like definitely seeps in. It's not a conscious decision, but it's definitely there. Oh, no, you just explained exactly my, my psyche. I'm the same way. I mean, I always relate yeah. TV movies in a daily life. I always think of a line where I think, I mean, I can't help it, you know, especially being a critic for 25 years. It was like yeah. that HBO uh, series from years ago in the 80s called Dream On. Remember that guy? Yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly how I saw that. I go, that's my brain. That's how it works. So how do you guys work together when you're writers? You know, do you have, you send each other, you have a bull session or is there, you know, an email or what? Take me through a typical writing session. Sure. Well, I, I can clarify the, the sort of nature of the co-writing credit. Um, Adam, after he procured uh, some seed funding for the film went and <laughs> wrote the script uh in really quickly uh we did principal principal photography uh then he edited a uh edited uh an assembly cut and and from that we learned uh sort of 
places where we had holes, things that we needed to fix and maybe uh, set up better. And so we did a couple of reshoots and it's during reshoots. That's when, that's where I sort of earned my, my writing credit from just the input uh, of figuring out and conceptualizing those scenes with Adam that, that would be the new scenes to kind of. McLeod has ridiculous instincts for story. Like he gives the best notes. Um, <laughs> when, before we did, before we even shot of photography you know we were sitting in my dad's kitchen uh kind of going through the script and like any questions that he had um the specific example i can remember is um when she's saying you know if you stay here i may never recover from the demerit i will be assessed that used to be the end of that thought but mcleod said well what demerit like what would be what would scare her to this and that's where uh shadow came from of like you know losing herself not being able to have any agency and then when it came time for the pickups you know we at that point we saw what worked and we saw what didn't and so we were kind of digging into the text and he's just you know uh mcleod's day job he narrates audiobooks like mcleod just lives in story and so it's like, well, you know, because I'll, I'll send him something that's like, hey, what about this weird, crazy, funny idea? And he's like, yeah, but what does it have to do with the story? And I'm like, but it's weird and crazy and funny. What do you mean? <laughs> and uh, so he like, and, and sometimes he's like, okay, that works. Like, that's really, that is really funny and weird. And like, let's find a way to make it work. Um, so it's not, you know, we're not like in a room. We're not passing a, a document back, you know, back and forth, like each one working on it. I, I kind of sit down and write and then send it to him and he makes it better. Yeah. So um, the, the relationship works. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have many discussions on the look of the spectral agent? Not really. Um, no? no, like. I think we both. Madeline, in, yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, Madeline Winter, Winters is the, uh, the makeup artist and um, she just we met, we talked about it. She had some really cool ideas. Um, I sent her, she got pictures of the actors and did like mock-ups of the character design as she saw it. And it was kind of like, uh, you know, Natalie did a self tape for Muriel and the second it starts, you're just like, oh, that's Muriel. Like, cool, hi Muriel. Um, like the second we saw Madeline's work, it was just like, oh, yep. Nope, that's exactly what this is. Um, you know, and she, she had ideas for how to differentiate you know, like that's where uh, Rosie's scars came from and whatnot. Like, yeah. So, I mean, it was just, she just, she knew. And uh, a lot of this movie was like collaboration and just like trusting, like letting people kind of be awesome at what they're awesome at. And, and, and always a decision to shoot in black and white. Cause I think it looks, it's just much more atmosphere shooting in black and white. I always wanted to make it in black and white. Uh, I love the black and white aesthetic. Uh, but I was on a, a location scout with my UPM, Chenny Chen, and I said, I think I want to make this a black and white. And she said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, and quite rightly, like black and white's a hard sell. We got a lot of no's from festivals and distributors simply because it's black and white. You know, people people don't want to see it or whatever. So um, so we shot it in color. We, we had the plan to release it in color. We had the plan for what the effect and after effects would be for Muriel. I have that oh. on my computer still, but uh, because we had to do fairly extensive reshoots, you know, Mike Potter shot principal photography um, and, you know, he had a, a lighting kit. So, I mean, not an extensive one, very minimal, but still he had lights. Uh, plus he was using his camera, which was a Blackmagic Ursa Mini, which is a 4K, and my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema, which is a digital 16. So then when we had to do our reshoots, I was shooting that because we couldn't afford to bring anybody back. And we didn't have any lights uh, outside of one scene that we just couldn't do with natural light. But otherwise we worked pretty pretty much exclusively with natural light and uh, and just the pocket six, uh, just the pocket cinema. So when it came time, you know, when it was editing and then color correcting, I could never get it quite as visually cohesive as I wanted. There was just slight differences. It would drive me insane. Um, and then finally one day McLeod said, hey, have you thought about making it in black and white? And I was like, you beautiful bastard. I <laughs> sure have. Uh, and you know, yeah, McLeod's it, always saving you, Adam. I, that's the like, thing I was interviewing. I'm you serious. He saves your like, ass every time, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like the, I mean, and again, like the second we, we just dropped a black and white LUT on it, and uh, which is a color correction algorithm. 
Um, and that's not what we ended up using. We actually did, uh, Ari Rothschild came on as in like color timed it to make it like the perfect black and white um, or the best it could be. Um, and, but it was just so right. It just felt right, tonally, thematically. It was just like, yep, that's the movie. Cool. It looked. It, <laughs> it looks great. I love the atmosphere. Like I said, who's the musician of the U two? You know, I, there's all this the original music in this and the songs. Uh, McLeod would be the musician of the two of us. <laughs> I I don't know how to play anything, and I definitely can't sing. Um, but it, music looms very large for me. So all this, all the songs except for one, the song that opens it, "Stubborn Love." Uh, by James L. Smith, by, J uh, by James e. L. Smith. E. e. Smith? I think you're thinking James L. Brooks. <laughs> I probably, yeah. By James Smith. <laughs> uh, James Smith. That's, uh, he, he and McLeod met years ago doing a play. Uh, every other song is like friends of mine. I've known Wussy since before they were a band. I've known Honey Honey for over 10 years now. Um, the Bengsons I met, they were workshopping their show 100 Days at the No Theater in Cincinnati. Uh, and it just, I knew that music would be a big part of, of, of when I finally got to make a movie, it would be, music would loom very large in it. Uh, so yeah, it, but you wrote, we both love music. Yeah, but you wrote the original song, uh, uh, White Ribbon, which Muriel sings to Jack in the third dream. You wrote that with Margaret Darling of the yeah. Seeds. Which was like a dream come true. I, Margaret was in a band called the CD Seeds and they're just, they were great. Um, and so get, like, getting to write a song with her was insane. Um, see, once again, McLeod comes in and saves us because I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, this uh, it looks like this is like the perfect training ground, you know, because it's, it's a, you know, small cast, you know, it's all shot in one place, you know, in one house, you know, and that's just great for filmmakers, you know, on a tight budget, you know, to utilize all of their resources that they have. Uh, so what's, what's your guys' next uh, project? Is it something a little, a little more ambitious? Uh, well, I mean, that's a, a pretty low, that's, that's a low bar to clear. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yeah. The thing that we're working on now, you know, it's funny. We like, I'm, I'm so sorry to, this isn't really an answer to the question, but I, I just wanted to note something real quick. It's interesting that there's all these stories now or all these films now that are like, because we're in quarantine, everybody's like, oh, there's these movies that are, you know, in one place. And it's like, well, that's far more economic than it is us speaking to a moment. Like all these movies are there for you to, to uh, discover that speak to the moment because we don't, like none of us had money. So it's just <laughs> like, well, you get one location and just use the hell out of it. Right. Um, I, which I, I, I was thinking about the other day because I was watching a movie and it's just like, oh, this is like, this speaks perfectly to what we're going through. And they shot it years ago. Um, I always think of that movie, A Fish Called Wanda. Have you seen that? You know, with oh, uh, that's one of my favorite. The scene towards the end of the movie where they're all running in the airport and they're going to the ticket counter and all like that. Uh, I remember a story about the producer uh, said they rented out that entire terminal for the shoot and the director only used that counter. And he shot, he goes, we took this whole place up. He goes, no, all we need is this little space, you know, right here at the ticket counter, you know? So he just said, we don't need, you know, to be going everywhere and doing that. We thought, you know, one space that, that centered for the film, you know? So I was thinking while I was watching this, I go, this is all taking place in this one house. By the way, is it one of your guys' houses? Who's, whose house nope. was that? John Mark James. Well, just thank you. Really cool guy <laughs> in Cincinnati. Thank you, James. Who, that, uh, there's yeah. the guy you're thinking of right there. That was the guy. Yeah. That James. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, congratulations. You know, it was funny. It was quirky. And uh, I just, I really enjoyed it. And uh, can't wait to see what you guys do next. And uh, come out to Vegas and visit us, man. We'd love to have you. All right. Cool. I've never <laughs> been. Yeah. What do you mean never been? Where are you guys at, by the way? Where'd you shoot the film? We shot the film in Cincinnati. That's uh, right. Because I remember in the beginning, he said the cockroach neighbors of Cincinnati. I thought, oh, it's in Cincinnati. Yeah. So yeah. I got that. Yeah. And then I'm I live in, in New LA York and Adam's yeah. in New York. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, cool. Well, I've never been to Cincinnati, you know, home of uh, Jerry Springer, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why I know Cincinnati. His illustrious political career. <laughs> well, congratulations, guys. Thanks for talking to me today. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care.